life is full of happiness, of joy. All of us experience this. But what happens when it all fades away? What happens when joy is replaced by trials, tribulations, and storms? How do we find our way back? All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Psalms 112. Today, we embark on a brand new series. And so if you're visiting with us or a guest, this is your first time, then uh, you picked a good day to come because we're starting on a, it'll be a four-part series uh, that's titled simply, How to Be Happy in an Unhappy World. How to Be Happy in an Unhappy World. Most of us know by now we, we live in an unhappy world, don't we? Turn on the news, you know, read, read the paper, open Facebook. You see, it's an unhappy world. You don't even have to do that. Uh, we, we can just go out in our day-to-day -day lives, and we come across people every day, if not every hour, who simply aren't happy. They're, they're just not happy. Some are not happy about their jobs or their career choices. And they're unhappy. Others are not happy uh, about their, their marriages. You have, you have single people who are unhappy because they want to be married. And, and you have married people who are unhappy because they want to be single. Right? And um, some people are unhappy about their current financial situation, just in debt up to their neck and don't know what you're going to do to get out. You need to get signed up today for Financial Peace University that starts next week. And it starts about 9.30, 9.45, right after the early service, and it's in between the two services. But people are unhappy because we're stressed out. We don't know what we're going to do, you know, how we're going to pay the bills. Some are unhappy with their children. Children are unhappy with their parents. I mean, it goes, it goes on and on and on. Some people are just unhappy and don't even know why they're unhappy. They're just unhappy people. They're like the guy I've told you about that got up one morning. His wife said, what do you want for breakfast? He said, eggs. She said, you want them scrambled or fried? He said, I want one scrambled, one fried. So she said, okay. She scrambled an egg. She fried an egg. Put it down in front of him. He said, that figures you scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> now, that's an unhappy person. But you ever met somebody like that? You can't please them? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you do, how hard you try, you can't please them? In fact, I would say it's a rare thing today to find someone who's genuinely happy. Someone who, after you spent some time with them, you can honestly look at them and say, wow, this is a really happy person. I mean, even when bad things happen to them, when bad things come their way, somehow, some way, they're still happy. They still, they, they manage it. And they, you know, they still have a peace about them. And our, honestly, our first thought is, what's wrong with them? I mean, God, worry. You ought to be worrying. You ought to be stressed, you know, and what's wrong with you? Our second thought is, I wonder what they're on, you know, and, and give me some, you know, because there's something is just not right about this. So when we, we do rarely come across a person like this, even if we thought we were pretty happy and content and at peace, suddenly we see these people and we feel like, man, I'm not like them. So then we get unhappy about that. And we just think, I wish, wish I could be happy like so-and-so. And, and, um, but would you understand it if I told you that God created us to be happy? That God loves it 
when we're happy. That's why he talks about make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You know, it's just he wants us to be happy. In one place he says, I want you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. It's true that many religions today actually teach the more unhappy you are, the more religious you are. Or the uglier you dress, the more religious you are. And that may be true. You may be more religious, but you're not more Christ-like. Because Christ was happy. Christ was, Christ was upbeat. Christ was, he, he you know, uh, he had this attitude of joy and peace and laughter and happiness about it. In fact, and I'm going to date some of you right here. How many of you remember the Partridge family? Huh? Oh, all right. You're telling your age. Partridge family was kind of an offshoot of the Brady Bunch, you know. It was, it was another little family here. And they had this theme song that, that came on as, as the show was coming on every day. But before the Partridge family had this, I think that could have been Jesus' theme song. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, a whole lot of loving is what we'll be bringing. Come on, get happy. Something always happens whenever we're together. We get a feeling when we're singing a song. You know, Maurice said, there's nowhere I need to be this morning but right here. Something always happens, you know. Come on, get happy. And, and so that could have been Jesus' theme song. That's not to say he didn't have bad days. That's not to say that he didn't get angry or he didn't get sad, as did his father before him. But for the most part, he was happy. He was upbeat. He enjoyed hanging out at wedding feasts and parties and, 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 and laughter. And, and he was always saying things like, be of good cheer. Cheer up, man. Let not your heart be troubled. Fear not. Do not be afraid. In fact, in the Bible, to references to this, fear not, do not be afraid, let not your heart be troubled. You know, there's 365 references to that. Isn't that interesting? That's one for every day of the year. One for every day of the year. Do not be afraid, fear not, let not your heart be troubled. If you remember from some of our past lessons in, in series that uh, we did on uh, Christianity, and, and I preached a series called Why I Don't Want to Be a Christian Anymore. Nowhere does God call on us to be religious. He doesn't even call on us to be Christians. Christian was a term, it was a pagan term created by a pagan king to really make fun of the Christ followers. He said they're a bunch of Christians or Christ people. And so he did, that wasn't what he was about, but he was continually putting the invitation out there to follow me. Follow me. Come follow me. Peter, put away your fishing nets and come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Matthew, put away your lucrative business that you've got and come follow me and I'll give you riches that are in heaven. Follow me. You know, he, he had this, he had this thing. Uh, um, you know, religious people follow me. Irreligious people follow me. Uh, mom, dad, follow me. Teenagers, follow me. Wealthy people, poor people, follow me. Come learn of my ways. And so having said all that, what would you say if I were to tell you that over the next three weeks that I can honestly give you the absolute keys to true happiness? To true, lasting, no kidding, no bait and switch, no religious rhetoric, just a concrete, absolute way to find true, lasting happiness and contentment. It sounds too good to be true, but it is true. And so, I, you know, would that be worth investing the next three Sundays of your life for? I think it would. So in light of that, we're going to begin this series, How to Be Happy in an unhappy world. Now, the thing is that I know and most of us know is most of us know how to get happy. That's not a problem. We know how to get happy. But far fewer, I think, may realize and understand how to remain happy over an extended period of time. I mean, you get a new car, you're happy. Get your first payment in, yeah, not quite as happy right? 
run it off in a ditch and you're just back unhappy again. Win the lottery. Oh, everybody's after the lottery now. You know, win the lottery. You're happy. Find out how much the government's going to take off the top. You're a little less happy. And then every cousin and third nephew's brother-in-law's wife's aunt's knocking on your door. Then you're just back unhappy and broke again. Right? On and on we could go. Some of you remember what, what I, I call the when-then syndrome. And it simply says, when I get blank, then I will be happy. And I can guarantee you that every one of us have walked down this road before in one way or another. When I get in school, then I'll be happy. When I graduate from school, then I'll be happy. When I get married, then I'll be so happy. When I get divorced, then I'll be happy. Am I right? When we have children, we'll be so happy. When the kids leave home, then I'll be happy. When I get a job, then I'll be happy. When I can retire, then I'll be happy. So, I mean, it, you know, a new house, a new car, a, a, a new iPhone, a new Xbox, on and on and on, all the time knowing in our hearts that none of this can bring lasting happiness. None of it can bring lasting joy and contentment. There's a song, country song out now that says, money can't buy me happiness, but it can buy me a boat. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's just about the just of it. That's sort of how we, we live our whole life. We know that what we're getting is a temporary, fleeting, short-term happiness. As soon as the money runs out, so does the happiness. So does the happiness. So what's the real key to lasting happiness? Well, we're going to be exploring this over the next three weeks. But I'll say this, it's more attainable and accessible than you may think. It's not as difficult as you may think. So for the remaining few minutes that we got together today, I'm just going to throw out a few bullet points. And you may want to write, write these down. Uh, if not, we'll be going over them and... and, and Hopefully, they'll kind of get seared into your mind, but, but then we'll start next week sort of unpacking these uh, a little bit more. Every time we turn on our television or radio or newspaper or magazine or open Facebook or whatever, you know, we, we find people promising us ways they can make us happy. And most of us, have at least once or twice or a dozen times or a hundred times walked into that trap only to find out that whatever it was they were selling could not and did not bring us true lasting happiness. I mean, we were waiting for the UPS truck to bring this thing that we've ordered, you know, on Amazon, and we're excited, and we get it, and we're excited, and six months, it's in a yard sale somewhere. That didn't work. Didn't chop my food any better than this, or didn't, you know, whatever it is. We know this in our heart. So the first thing I want you to know about real true, lasting happiness. And probably this is the most important thing. Probably the most important thing we'll say the whole series. I want this, I want this seared into your mind because this is the basis and the foundation for what this whole series is built on, is that real, true, lasting happiness, the key to it is always going to be a who and not a what. And you need to get that straightened out in your heart and in your mind right off the bat. This is one of the earliest lessons we learned. We learned it in the backyard when we were eight years old, nine years old, playing with a bunch of who's. Did not care what they had. Didn't care what we were playing. We were just, what we cared about were the who's. 
We, we had our group of friends, so whatever we're doing is fine. I don't care how much, you know, money they have. I don't care what, you know, it's the who. We go on to junior high. It don't really matter what you have or what you, as long as I find the right group of who's and, and so on right on up the, the ladder. Let me say it this way. True happiness is always associated with a who or a group of who's. Always. You see, if it was about a what, we could just go out and get our happy what, and, and, and we would be happy all the time. It wouldn't matter how you treated me. It wouldn't matter what I did because I got my happy what. And my what just, that's what, that's what makes me happy. That's what, but it doesn't work that way. Happiness is more about a who than a what. See, here's the problem with a happy what. A what always leads to what's next. Doesn't it? A what always leads to what's to come. We're always waiting on the newer model, the, ne the next thing to make me happy. To make, uh, uh, you know, think about this. You were as happy when you got your old cell phone as you will be when you get your new one. I don't care if it was an old flip phone, you know, or one of them bag phones or, you know, this big phone. You were just as excited when you got that baby carrying it around with two hands. You know, but you don't even have to be talking to anybody. You just want to walk around with it, you know, because you got this. You remember those phones? You were just as excited about that thing as you were when you got the iPhone 96, you know, whatever, That's because it's got two more gigabytes and you can take 12 more selfies on it. So you, you, were, just as, you were just as excited when you got your old car as you will be when you get your new car. I remember my first car, 67 Ford XL, big old long car, man, I said, my daddy had drove it, my brother had drove it, and finally it was mine. I, I rode around like I was in a limo, buddy. I mean, just excited, and, and, and I was just as excited, maybe more so than any other car I've ever had, just as excited, because we're always waiting on that next thing, the next what that's going to Make it. In fact, I'll say this. Listen to this closely. If an aging what or an older what deflates your happiness, you weren't really happy to start with. Just because your what's got a and they've got a newer what now, if, if that's if that makes you unhappy because you don't have you know the, the 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 next newest latest model, then you weren't happy. To start with not, with, not with a lasting happiness, not with a true. You just became a victim of shrewd marketing. You ever wonder, why, I mean, why Apple and all these people are constantly coming out? I mean, they don't have to change but one little thing, and we got to get it. I mean, this thing. You know, you ought to see the pictures. It, well, my old phone takes pretty good pictures, you know. But it's like we, we got to get it. You, and, and so they're marketing geniuses, and so many of us fall victim. I can remember going on mission trips and seeing people who had practically nothing when it comes to what's. I mean, they, they literally had no what's, but what they did have was this lot of who's. And you would see this overwhelming sense of, of joy and laughter, and, and you think, how can these people be so happy? I remember these long plane rides home of just sitting and thinking, how can these people who have nothing be so happy? And, you know, you feel a little convicted and you feel, you know, you feel confused. And, and I don't know, it was just amazing that how they can have so few what's and still be genuinely happy because life to them and happiness to them was more about who's than it was what's. Sometimes, sometimes we say it like this. If mama's not happy, ain't nobody happy, right? If mama's happy, everybody's happy. The truth is, Generally, we're no happier than our unhappy spouse. 
Generally, we're no happier than our most unhappy child. Our happiness is tied to who's, not what's. There's that, that, when, when our child is unhappy, then we're unhappy. There's something, you know, that's, that's, that's bigger than another thing. Another thing is not, so, so it, it's tied to a who. All right. I'm going to start trying to bring this in for today because I'm just kind of giving you an overview and then we're really going to dig into this starting next week. But but um, if you don't believe what I've told you so far, if you say, you know, uh, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but, but um, you know, I just, I, I, I like what's, you know, and I just, what's make me happy and, and um so if that, if that's you and you 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 just don't believe that, let me, here's your homework assignment for this week. Go out and find you a few people who are say seventy and over, and you begin to ask them. You you, you talk to them about their greatest regrets in life. And I guarantee you, I'm not telling you something I read out of a book. I worked for hospice for, for as their chaplain uh, several years ago. And, and so I know this to be a fact. I guarantee you that 99 out of 100, if not 100 out of 100, would talk to you. If they talked to you about their greatest regrets, they would always be tied to a who and not a what. They won't talk to you about the car they couldn't afford to buy and how they just regret they never got to take this vacation or how, how they never got to have these clothes or even the house they had to live in or, or, or something. But they, they'll, speak, they'll speak of words that they never got to say. They'll, they'll talk to you about, about uh, time that they wish they had spent with their kids and their grandkids instead of here and there and doing this. They'll, they'll, they'll talk to you about relationships that were destroyed over petty things. I would, talk to these, I would talk to these people and they would have tears in their eyes saying their son hadn't been to see them in 20 years. Because we had a fight. We had this. We had that. Regrets. Always tied to a who, not a what. Ladies, when you reach the evening shade of your life, I promise you, you're not going to say, hey, could, could you bring all my shoes to the hospital room and just pile them around me? I just need a little time alone with my shoes, right? Men, you're not going to ask the orderly, could you push me out in the parking lot? I just need a few minutes with my car. No. No. Because you realize something, and it's a shame it takes us to the end many times to realize that true happiness is not about a what. It's about a who. It's about a who. In the end, you're going to be trying to make peace, not with a what, but, but with the, the who's that were in your life, or maybe more importantly, the who's that were not in your life. All right. A final thought. Maybe you're here today and you're feeling still a little pushback on this. You're saying, nah, people just don't make me happy. My family don't make me happy. Relationships don't make me happy. What, what, what's make me happy? Things make me happy. Stuff makes me happy. I don't need who's in my life. Then don't get upset with me here, but, but I'm fixing to tell you something that I know about you you're going to fit into one of two categories. Number one is you have always been surrounded with so many who's in your life, so many friends, so much family that you really don't understand what it's like to live without a who. You have no idea. You, you've been so abundantly blessed. You don't understand what it's like to live without family, without friends. You have been so blessed with who's that you, you can't even comprehend what it's like to be hooless. Sound like the Grinch. Didn't they live in Whoville or somewhere? 
You're hooless. You don't know what it's like to be hooless. You don't know what it's like to be alone and feel isolated and ostracized and outcast. Or, number two, you're, you're, you're in the group that you have been hooless for so long that you've convinced yourself you don't really need who's to be happy. Because often that's, that's what we do. Uh, that, that's what we do with what's. You know, if you get there and you know you're never going to be able to get that house, you're never going to be able to afford that car, you're never going to be able to take that vacation, we get a little bit bitter and we say, you know what, I don't want it anyway. I don't need that. No, I don't want it. Because we're a little bit angry. Other people got it. We can't have it. And we say, I don't know. And we do the same thing with who's. Would we? We've, we've never had these who's, these relationships, these things. We say, I don't need that. I don't need a wife. I don't need a, I don't need a church. I don't need, ah, uh, I don't have to go to church to be saved. I've heard it a thousand times. I don't, I don't need a church. I don't need, I don't need family. I don't need, I don't need friends. I, I'm, I'm doing fine on my own. And you've convinced yourself you don't need this. Even knowing that God when he created the first man, think about this. He created Adam, and Adam had every what in the world. He was the CEO of the world. He had everything. And yet God looks at him and says, it's just not good for man to be alone. You need a who. I'm going to make a who for you. I'm going to make a helpmate for you. I'm going to make somebody to share. I made you because I wanted somebody to share my love with, but now you've got nobody to share that love with. So I'm going to make you a who. I'm going to make somebody you can share that love, and then there'll be somebody that she can share her love with. And pretty soon you have a whoville. You'll have a whole group of who's. Church, when you get this burned into your mind and you get this one thing settled in your mind, that true, lasting happiness is always going to be tied to a who or a group of who's, never a what. Because what's, no matter how many you get, there's always going to be another what dangling out in front of you. Amen? Thank you so very much for joining us here today at Church in the Rock. Today's message has been a part of Roger's series, Finding Lasting Happiness in an Unhappy World. We pray that throughout this series that you learn how to cope with the different negative situations that life throws at us. Now, if this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org. There you can look at our latest podcast, tell us how this series touches you, or give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.